This is a video about the warmth and protection exhibit at the Mount Kearsarge Indian Museum in the summer of 2015. It was curated by Vera Longto Sheehan, who is with the Elnu Abenaki tribe. And one of the first speakers in this video telling us about the exhibit and telling us about the art of Francine Portress Jones. You'll also meet Julia Martin from the Wampanoag Nation, who talks about her traditionally painted regalia. Francine Portress Jones from the Nulhegan Abenaki tribe also talks to us about her art. Liz Charbonboy and Vera Longto Sheehan also tell us about the Walking with Our Sisters exhibit that is being brought to the Shaker Village Museum in New Hampshire in August of 2016. Many of the organizing meetings have happened at the Mount Kearsarge Indian Museum. Walking with Our Sisters is a commemorative exhibit to honor the thousands of missing and murdered indigenous women of North America coming to New Hampshire in August of 2016. For more information, you can go to Walking with Our Sisters semicolon in Dakina on Facebook, and also you can go to walkingwithoursisters.ca for more information. Mohegan author Melissa Tonka Quitjion Zobel gives us a short presentation and book reading from Wobanaki Blues. Her recent book signing event happened also at the Mount Kearsarge Indian Museum. You will see some of the exhibit, including work by Jerry Byron, Rhonda Besall, and Chris Bullock, and Lena Longto Sheehan. My name is Deb Rigger, host and producer of Moccasin Tracks. You can go to indianmuseum.org to find out more information about the Mount Kearsarge Indian Museum. And I told her that I wanted them to be based on historic clothes. And I said, can I send you JPEGs of historic photos or links to, to them online? And can you draw pictures? And she was like, I think I can do that. So I sent them off to her. And she was so excited, she got in it right away and started sending me charcoals of the original photos on Rawhide. And in addition to studying these photos, for over 20 years, I've been also studying our history and gathering information. Clothing was one of my early passions as far as art, so I paid particular interest to clothing in all of these first-hand accounts. So as she started sending me charcoals, we did a lot of back and forth over the telephone. And she was tweaking things as we went along from clothes to how wide is the ribbon and, and things of that nature. And so this is actually, this 18th century picture here is one of the ones based on the, on the uh, it's called 18th century Abenaki couple two. The first one is actually in the gift shop. Um, but this, this was the first one we worked on. The one in the gift shop was the first one we worked on and then this one was the second one. And we just spent hours on the telephone and she was sending me uh, iPad pictures of the, the artwork as it was progressing and we were changing, you know, okay, let's change the, the moccasin a little bit this way or let's change the ribbon work over here. And we just went back and forth and we became fast friends through this project. It, it was absolutely amazing. She, you know, she was so flexible, so, so willing, so excited. And she worked passionately through these. She was producing these in record time. Uh, so we started with the 18th century one, and then um, that's how it all started. I sent her, for this one, I sent her a photograph of Champlain, uh, Samuel D. Champlain's drawings. And there was a lovely, it was a lovely photo of a woman there. And what you can't see in this photo is this strap is part of a baby holder. And there's actually a baby in the bag. But because this is a contemporary exhibit and there might be kids coming through, you know, we, we decided maybe a topless woman shouldn't be in here. <laughs> uh, but, but this is not just, this is the Look into the backgrounds. I mean, she added things that are not in the 18th century photos at all. You see the, you were asking about the waterways, so you have the waterways here. You can see there's a wigwam. We had villages always near water. You know, water is an absolute necessity. You can see the canoe here in the background. Um, over here, I love this one, I have to tell you. The baby is on her hips still. You just can't see it because she's turned. But here's the strap to the baby holder. And so it was very common for us to walk around with our children. But on the know. hip, not here, not, not we, in the back. We, we also had cradle boards for yeah. the back. 
But like women, if you look at indigenous women in any other culture, they sling. You they carry sling. your yeah. baby for a long time, and I know that even with my own, I probably the first couple of years they were on me, and you just keep on doing everything sort of one-handed. Or if you're wearing a sling, you have two hands um, until they're ready to just take off, and you know then they go off and they join the pack of the bigger kids. And when the kids are in our village, they're like, I've always called our kids steps. You know, the two-year-old with the three-year-old, the four-year-old, the five-year-old, and, and, you know, up to maybe 13, 14-year-old kids, you know, they go off together, and it's always like, don't come back without your cousin. <laughs> um, but the kids, uh, in my family, we've done living history, which you may know as reenacting, but we don't consider us to, ourselves to be reenactors at all, because what we're doing is based on our own ancestry, and it's based on research about our ancestry. So it's not the same as somebody who may be French pretending to be English or, mm -hmm. or somebody who has no Native American ancestry dressing up as a Native American and doing that, which there are many people that dress as Native Americans at reenactments that really aren't. But there are also many Native Americans that are getting into this whole movement. I've been doing that for like 20 years. Who do you do it for? Who's the audience? Um, we started working with historic sites probably 20 something years ago. I don't even know how long it's been. Um, but we've done things at many historic sites throughout, throughout um, the Northeast and up into Canada. I've done as far as Niagara, Fort Niagara, uh, but Fort Ticonderoga, Fort Number Four, um, uh, Chimney Point. Are so can states. I ask you people in dress? What does your dress say about you as an Abenaki person today, 2015? What I'm wearing right now? Exactly, yeah. We're, what is it? we're adaptable. <laughs> Okay. Interesting. We are completely adaptable. Every every project I take on, it, it's something we were talking earlier about things that are built into certain people. What I would say about myself and about all of my cousins in the broader community, I would say we're very adaptable people, and we had to be to survive to this point. So in like this case, what I'm wearing right now is a Quahog necklace made by uh, Jim Taylor who's on the El New Abenaki Tribal Council, and he's also in this exhibit over here. This photo is my, my, my daughter, Lena Longto, and that's a quilled moccasin. He was just here teaching the class. And, uh, and there's also a quilled knife sheath in the back, and he makes wampum. And what is Kohog? Kohog is a clamshell that's used to make wampum beads, okay. which I don't think we have any in this exhibit, but if you look at the photo up here, uh, she has, it. see the little purple and white beads? Yeah. The purple ones would be made from quahog shell. Um, if you ever got casino clams, the stuffed clams, you know the purple spot in the middle? That's what was used to make the beads. But this is a different color. This, this well, there's only a little purple spot in those beads. And so the rest is white. So you're wearing a native piece? Yes, it's a contemporary native piece. So it, it still, as far as I'm concerned, it still holds the same spiritual value as wampum would hold. It's, it's held certain spiritual properties because it comes from the ocean. It hurt, holds certain protective things, um, and the design means something to me as well. And you would always wear some native piece. I always have something, even if you don't see it. Can I show you another contemporary native piece? Really, that is gorgeous. This is made by um, Lynn Murphy. Oh, okay. From certain things, we don't just learn things in one way. If one way doesn't work, we move on to the next way. What would if be an example of that? Like, like what? Traditional learning. Per, uh, in the classrooms today, teachers tend to use a method that's called uh, perch and preach, where they stand in the front of the classroom, all the students face them, and they recite, and they expect the kids to learn from that. They're supposed to be able to take their notes. Not every kid can. Um, in the Abenaki community, there are a lot of people that are dyslexic, for instance. And dyslexic isn't necessarily just letters and numbers turning themselves. There are also executive function aspects to that. Mm -hmm. So a form of adaptability. We know that perch and preach isn't working, so we start implementing other methods using multi-sensory techniques, which is interesting because there are reading methods, like the Orton-Gillingham uh, reading method or Wilson reading training methods that are catching on to things we've just been doing. And when you say we, are there Abenaki schools, or you're talking about public schools? I'm usually like, what? I'm um, looking. How yeah, can you not yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm waiting for you to talk about your area. <laughs> 
So my earrings are beaded. They were a gift from my father who bought them for my cousin, Takara, um, who uh, she was supposed to be here, but she couldn't make it because she moved. Um, but she's a very talented uh, bead worker. Um, but so, yeah, the little things, like there are definitely mannerisms. But these are Abenaki beadwork or what? Um, this contemporary. Is contemporary. contemporary. She Paul, does a lot of... Paul, you have to photograph that. I mean, you're incredible. Takara is just like, she's oh. full of bling. Yeah, my <laughs> she's cousin great. TK, she will also do beadwork of graffiti designs. And like she, she works with this one yeah. graffiti artist, not for oh, oh, oh. delinquency purposes, wow. but just that style. Yes, yes. Painted. So Liz, who was in here a minute ago, she, in one of our today, and, and I was saying how we're adaptable, but our ancestors were adaptable as well. Of course. Um, they survived. Yeah. We, we had to be adaptable to survive, but we still need to be adaptable to survive. Um, if we look around this room, and you see that in so many of the pieces. Um, For sterilization of the women. Of everyone. Of everyone. Um, it, it actually started at UVM with a professor by the name of Henry Perkins, who was a zoology professor. And this was, this was, I hate to say this, this was the literal inspiration for the Holocaust. But there was a thank you letter. For the Holocaust, excuse me. Um, there was actually a thank you letter, I think UBN has it now, but written by the SS to the state of Vermont saying, we based our concentration camps off of native reservations. And they took Henry Perkins' ideology down to a team. So basically at um, hi, my name is Julia Martin. I'm a Quinn Wampanoag, and I'm one of the artists participating in the Warmth and Protection exhibit at Mount Kiyosage India Museum. Uh, and I'm standing next to uh, some, some of my pieces that are in here. This is my uh, actual traditional outfit for a powwows and ceremony. It's uh, Eastern women's uh, traditional outfit made from deer skin and it's painted with uh, acrylic paint in uh, Eastern woodland designs. And uh, also I have a twine sash and leg artist set. different geographic areas. And uh, chevron necklaces. And behind me is a dance show that matches the whole set. And the, the main theme is the tree life or a celestial tree, the, de the painted design. And where do you live now, Julia? Oh, I, I live in South Rygate, Vermont now, but I moved up from Massachusetts. Aquina is located on the island of Martha's Vineyard, down on the Cape. In the 18th century. My name is Francine Poitras Jones. I'm with the Nulhegan Abenaki tribe. And I was asked by Vera Long Toshian to paint uh, the paintings behind me specifically for this show. Uh, the one in the middle is called 18th Century Abenaki Couple Number no. 2. Uh, mainly because number one was a smaller painting, and when she saw it, she said, I need it bigger. So this is what we came up with. And it is uh, depicting the style that it would be worn in the 18th century. Uh, the only leather that they basically wore at the time were their shoes, their moccasins, which you can see in the painting. Uh, the lady is wearing a match coat. The gentleman is wearing a blanket. And they are meant to be a couple. Uh, they're both wearing the peaked caps of the day. Everything was made in, um, base, uh, except for the chemise that the lady is wearing, was made out of wool, which was a trade cloth of the day. Uh, the trade cloths were was available in uh, navy blue uh, and red and uh, in very basic colors uh, because of the limitation of the dyes. So I did my best to depict this. Um, we worked together and she went through all the different th features of the style of clothing, including the earrings that they are wearing, the jewelry, uh, the gorget that the gentleman is wearing, which would have been made out of a shell. Uh, the uh, painting of the uh, lady uh, is she's pounding corn. That would be the 17th century, and she is known, uh, this is called the 17th century Abenaki girl. And um, they wore, in the 17th century, very little, as you can see. Uh, the women would typically, in the summer, wear nothing but a skirt. 
Uh, she has a, a little uh, piece that is draped over her shoulder, and though you can't see it, she would have been carrying a baby. But the baby's kind of slung behind her because we wanted to have modesty for any of the museums that a painting like this would go into. The other painting is called the 19th Century Abenaki Chief. And he is wearing a, um, a coat uh, of the uh, day. Uh, that is a, called a chief's coat, and actually there is one very similar to it here in this museum that was made by Rhonda Besaw. And you will see that he is carrying a staff, a, uh, it is a wampum staff, and the, side, the way that he has it carried up and down it actually depicts war. So that's why I gave him a very serious look. And again, this is something that I worked with on with Rhonda to make sure that we had all the technical details correct for the painting. You will notice he's wearing um, just regular slacks, maybe a, maybe like a suit, and he's wearing good old-fashioned shoes like a man would wear in the day because by then the uh, native people were dressing. This exhibit started out, I think it was meant to be a clothing timeline on clothing worn throughout the, new, the Northeast, but it's, it evolved since the idea came about. And I think what you'll see as you walk through the room is a lot of clothing based on original pieces from archaeology, from first-hand accounts, from 18th century uh, watercolors, from uh, pen and ink drawings, and art that we Many of us have learned either through family tradition and or we've learned from a friend or another talented artist. So we have so many different types of textiles here. I'm really not sure where to start. Um, I've included so many talented artists. I wish I had more space in the room uh, to get a lot more people in here. I want to introduce some artists. So I'm going to look around. Uh, when I see your name, could you just raise your hand? So we have Julia Martin in the back of the room in the dress, black dress. And her dress and her shawl are on the wall over here. And it's a uh, painted leather dress and painted shawl. Let's see who else? Willow Green and Liz Charlebois. And they did the Doctor Who inspired fancy dance shawl over here, which is pretty amazing. We're going to have to turn on the fan so you can see the ribbons move. Uh, Jerry Byron's in here somewhere, over here in the back. And he did the painting over here. And I'm probably going to ask artists when we're, after I'm done to go stand by your artwork and maybe you can speak about your own art so people hear about it the way you'd like to tell it. Uh, we also have a real contemporary rendition of an indigenous outfit over here in the corner. Blue jeans, chucks, and a powwow t-shirt. <laughs> and that's the kid that hangs out in the corner because they don't want to socialize. If the only thing missing is a Game Boy <laughs> or a cell phone, perhaps. Uh, in the far back, on the wall, there are some paintings by Charlene Quattrus Jones. Raise your hand. Francine. Francine, I'm sorry. <laughs> a little nervous. Um, in any case, her paintings are all based on historic uh, historic watercolors and pen and ink. And her research in that. Uh, Lena Longto has some photographs up on the walls that she can talk about on her own. Chris, Chris where are you? Hey, how are you? I've never met you. <laughs> nice to meet you. <laughs> um, Chris Bullock has done this really amazing um, painted coat over here that's done in the style of the Scoffy Cree Montagnier people. And the most amazing thing about this outfit is it has all the different component pieces. So it's a painted leather jacket, leggings, moccasins. Uh, I think there are leg ties in here and associated bags. And we tried to set this one up sort of a little diagonally so people can walk and get a good view of the back of it as well. Uh, let's see, who else is here? I think, are there any other artists I missed in here? Okay, so we have a good, good amount of the artists already here in the room. So I'd really like if you guys could speak for your own pieces. 
Um, if you could take a few minutes, kind of hang out by your piece and let people come and talk to you about it. And then, you know, we can then regroup and, you know, look at each other's pieces. Uh, oh, I'm the other artist. Sorry, I forgot myself. Um, so I have the textile dress over here that's based on uh, some of the archaeological archeologi finds up at Missisquoi in northern Vermont. And this is really my own rendition of what thing clothing could have possibly looked like. It's actually a work in progress that's being made for another exhibit. And that's going to be coming around next year. And over in this section, Jim Taylor is not here, but he's an amazing full worker. He has a great piece of full work up in here. There's uh, twine pieces by Julia Martin and her daughter Leah uh, up in here. There's a piece with a combination of shell medallions uh, that's done by Fred Wiseman. And I'd really just like you to take a look at everything and just see the amazing adaptability of our clothing. You know, we've gone through such an evolution in clothes, starting with textiles in our archaeology, wearing buckskins. Uh, when Europeans came here, starting to use trade cloth and I think this exhibit really explores what is tradition and what's contemporary. And I, I really consider everything in this room to be traditional because at what point does something become tradition? If we've been using glass beads from Europeans or European trade cloth for 400 years, is it traditional? So um, I think that's really important. And even in our, when we're wearing our blue jeans and you know, like today I'm in a dress, and contemporary shoes, but I'm, I'm wearing my Quahog jewelry. So I still have that representation tying myself back to older times. So I'd just like you to think of us as adaptable people and our clothing is still here. We still have representations of our traditional clothing. And if you have any questions, please, please, please talk to the artists themselves. And one last thing and before I, we go back to Liz, I wanted you to take a moment and reflect here. Uh, this moccasin display was put together to get everybody in New Hampshire and Vermont thinking about the Walking With Our Sisters exhibit that's going to be, that's been touring through Canada. It's going to be coming into the United States in August of 2016. And it's a, com a commemorative exhibit. Um, in honor of murdered and missing indigenous women. It's a tough subject to talk about, but it's being brought to New Hampshire and we're put it, we have a committee that's gonna be working on that and there'll be more information coming about that over the coming months. So please, please, if you're on Facebook, go to Walking With Our Sisters New Hampshire uh, to keep track of that and how it's coming. But just start thinking about that and we'd really like everyone to come out when that comes along. Um, that's a project I'm working on with Liz Charlebois and do you want to say something about um, it? In, in, sure. And uh, then you can also okay. introduce Melissa. Okay. Uh, so like Vera mentioned, uh, Walking With Our Sisters is a commemorative exhibit um, honoring murdered and in missing indigenous women. Um, so for the past forever, um, there's been a really high percentage of, of Native women who disappear and their, their disappearances are never uh, investigated. Um, and as you know, women are the heart of our, of our culture, of our society. And um, so this is really in honor of those lives that ended too soon. Um, and so it's a very poignant, emotional um, experience. <coughs> Um, M. Kim is, is um, hosting this with the Native community, and we are only, we were one of two U.S. locations. All the other shows have been in Canada. Um, so this is, um, it's going to take a lot of work and a lot of sweat and a lot of tears um, to get this show here. Um, and so with Vera starting to open this dialogue um, in this exhibit is really important. Um, so, um, 
if you have any other questions about that, you can ask either one of us. We are both on the planning committee of this, or as she mentioned, you could look on Facebook. They also have a Walking With, your, with Our Sisters um, website um, that shows the different exhibitions, um, and it is a seven-year traveling art installation. Um, and it has over 800 artists, well, 1,800 artists that have made moccasin vamps mm -hmm. in honor of these women. It was originally started uh, when Christy put out the call. She was looking for 400 moccasin vamps, and it just keeps on growing. They, and I think growing. they have over. I think it's um, over 1,100 vamps. Um, 1,700. Okay, yeah. over 1,700. Oh, I, <laughs> There's a lot. There's a lot. It's. It's going to be an interesting exhibit, besides just getting everybody thinking about it, when the exhibit is installed, you actually walk down the path next to the footsteps that are honor, made to honor all these missing women, and it's a very, very emotional experience. This is an important project, a really important project, especially you know, in context of when we think about what's happening in this country right now with all people of color yes. and the oppressions and the um, excessive force that's been used with a lot of people, but also this is, this is something that just classically has not even been spoken of in the public arena. So this is an incredible, thank you for taking this on, it's just so important. A lot of work, thank you. Our good friend out in the lobby signing books. Uh, this is Melissa Tantaquich and Sobel. She is from the Mohegan tribe in Connecticut and she's written a book called Wabanaki Blues um, and she's agreed to speak for a few minutes um, and tell us about her book and I believe there might even be a reading in there. <laughs> so please welcome Melissa uh, Tantaquich and Sobel. Greetings, everyone. Uh, I'm very, very happy to be here today. Um, I know a lot of friendly faces in the audience, and I have, as many of you know, uh, a good many friends in Wabanaki country, and I'm very honored to be here in your country. Thank you for having me. I always enjoy being here. There's, there are no exceptions. Uh, there's just something wonderful about being here, and, and your exhibit is wonderful. And Liz, thank you so much for being a friend and for also having me here. Uh, this is a story that uh, is born of love and of love for a people. And the roots of it go back quite a while, but it's also a young adult novel. And uh, it's a young adult novel because it's really something that we find, I think, when we grow up with our communities and we live with our communities that we want our young people to have stories that are about them and that they can share with their families and that they can look to. And uh, my friend Marge Bruchak's here today. Of course, her, her brother Joe was who I read growing up, a person who gave me some of the first young adult stories that I could read. And uh, I am trying to put together some of that, that same sort of energy um, for the next generation. So. I will just briefly read. I will also tell you that because I'm here in someone else's territory, I have lots of giveaways today. Um, <laughs> please take free sunglasses. Those are for you. Uh, I am giving away a Wabanaki Blues Bear, and I have bookmarks and all sorts of goodies that I brought for my friends today. Uh, help yourselves. You don't have to buy a book. Please, these are just gifts, and I want you to have them. So I hope you enjoy. Uh, I'm going to read you a very short section of the book, and it's a section that's very dear to my heart because it talks about the woods. And one of the things that my people, the Mohegans, are lacking in southern New England uh, are woods. We've lost most of our woodlands, and up here in northern New England, you've done a much better job than we have of taking care of them. And we honor you for that. And this is the story of a young woman who is a Mohegan and Abenaki woman, and she's grown up in Hartford. I don't know if we have anyone here who knows Hartford or grew Hartford, up in Connecticut. You have to Hartford, Connecticut, not Hartford. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> there are there like are there three? I think 
are there two or three Harfords? But the, New Hampshire? Is it Hartford, New Hampshire, or Hartford, Vermont? Vermont. 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 Hartford, Vermont. And uh, so this young woman grew up in the big city yeah. of Hartford, big city, New England size big city of Hartford, Connecticut. And so she's visiting the woods for the first time, and uh, this is her reaction. She is 17 years old, and uh, she doesn't know that much about her, her native traditions. Something shifts the moment my parents disappear, and it's just me alone in these woods. I may be what Grumps, that's her grandfather, calls a city gal, but I sure don't hate trees or foliage like Mom. The mud engulfing my feet isn't that bad either. It's warm and soft, welcoming actually, like the trees. The sun has just slipped below the horizon and suddenly everything is illuminated, glowing. Like each tree radiates its own light from deep inside, the general lack of man-made noise adds to this effect. There are no beeping sidewalks, no squealing brakes, no blasting car stereos. There's not another human being in earshot. Like, I'm in one of those religious movies where all the good people rocket off planet Earth and leave us losers behind. But it's not really silent. The sounds here are simply new ones. These woods have their own melody. My soap, Chuck Taylor's Snickers, gurgle and pop in the mud. Bebop, a loop Not far away, something grinds low and throaty in a real Ray Charles whiskey growl. That growl's coming from a different direction than the black bear we saw earlier. How many bears can there be up here? Until today, I thought they were extinct in New England. Surprise on me. I focus on more comforting sounds. A whippoorwill whistles its shrill evening cry, and a red-headed woodpecker offers a jazz downbeat. Rat-a-tat, rat-a-tat-tat. This place may not be as much of a blues haven as Shank Daddy's neighborhood at the other end of Manburn Street in Hartford, but it's definitely got strains and rhythms. I'm probably noticing more sounds because I can see less and less. The sun has dropped like a stone, turning the sky from passion pink to grizzly gray. Everything appears in shadow or silhouette. I pull a peanut butter, honey, and banana sandwich from my duffel and consider dropping bits of it along this trail in case I need to find my way back. Then I remember those stupid videos of Yellowstone National Park where campers leave out food and hungry bears attack them. <laughs> The animals won't bother you if you don't bother them. That's what mom said. But what does she know? It's better not to lure the bears. I pass a boulder shaped like a giant turtle. Yellow cat eyes pop out from behind it. It's a mountain lion, but it merely blinks at me like I'm a fellow homie from the hood. <laughs> I can see why Grump stayed up here when Bilky died and didn't return to tribal housing on the Mohegan Reservation. The place draws you in. Plus, considering my grandfather's temperament, I realize how fortunate we are he chose to stay up here in these woods. Wait a minute. These woods? What if these woods are nowhere near Bilby's house? What if my parents dropped me off on the wrong road? Mom had a lot of trouble locating the turn. A sharp chill begins in my neck and skitters to my toes. Mom is heavily medicated. She could have easily picked the wrong road. I keep moving because stopping will get me nothing. A hum fills the air. Maybe from a swarm of insects? Maybe from the wind? Maybe from the whispers of the trees? Are they guiding me? Either way, it's soothing. The last gleams of sunlight twinkle through the white pines like holiday light bulbs going out on this land full of Christmas trees one by one. My eyes adjust to see things in a strange, gloaming blue light. The mountain lion that was behind the boulder has moved closer, but still doesn't feel threatening. A bull moose saunters past me and nods. Orange pineal mushrooms on the side of an oak stump expand before my eyes. I recognize them from nature class at tribal camp. Soft moss spreads across the forest floor. I can see things growing. 
I avoid an anthill because my eyes peer through the earth like the bustling insect metropolis. I belong to this forest like I've never belonged anywhere. I am these oaks and pines. I'm the moss. I'm the mushrooms. I'm the wildcat. I am the moose. I am the ants. I'm all of it. OK, I'm also overtired. I trip and fall on a flat stone with a sharp edge that bruises my foot. So much for my cosmic unification with the great north woods. I check my guitar, Rosalita. Fortunately, she remains undamaged because I dropped her onto my duffel bag. I don't bother to get up. What's the point? I have no idea where I'm going or where I am. I sit rubbing my sore and injured foot. In my exuberance over these woods, I got careless and stupid. I should have been more careful. I don't dare try and stand. What if I can't get up? What if nobody comes looking for me for a month? That's what happened to Mia Delaney at my school, wasn't it? Her classmates assumed she rode off with her lover into the sunset when he circled back to the school basement and locked her inside. Her parents didn't search for her at her own high school. If they did, they could have saved her. What kind of parents don't comb every inch of their kid's territory after they disappear? Wait, what kind of parents drop their daughter off in the middle of New Hampshire in the woods without making sure that she gets to her grandparents' cabin safely? My foot throbs. I lay my head on my duffel and stare up at the stars. There are so many here. I pick out the few constellations I know, and the temperature drops, sending shivers through me. Bilky, what am I supposed to do, I ask, lifting my arms to the stars and jangling my charm bracelet. My grandmother comes through with only one word, reach. What does she mean? Reach for the stars? Reach inside myself? Reach around me? What does she mean? Thank you.